This is a video series covering all of the essential information that you need to know for the rotation unit in AP Physics C. And the topic of this video is moment of inertia. Uh, so I'm going to start out by um, thinking about what our traditional definition of inertia is. And so uh, down here, um, we're really saying that inertia itself is a measure of an object's resistance to changes in motion, meaning the higher an object's inertia is, the harder it is to move or to stop. Um, so if we think about what like value that's correlating to, um, generally it correlates directly to mass. Like a bus is going to be harder to um, change the motion of than let's say like a ping pong ball. So when we're starting to uh, transition into like the rotational uh, realm of things, rotational inertia, or uh, it's more generally called moment of inertia, should measure an object's resistance to changes in uh, its rotational motion. So uh, to get thinking about like how we could get a formula for this, um, we're gonna think about the kinetic energy of an object. Let's, let's suppose that we have a point mass that's kind of in circular motion around some central axis, like we've got pictured over here, and it's all standard things. It's got just a mass m, it's a distance r away from the axis, and it's moving with a constant tangential velocity of v, meaning it's just moving around in uniform circular motion. So if we're thinking about the kinetic energy of this object, then it's really just gonna be one half mv squared as normal. Um, and so our goal from there is like with all of our other like transitional quantities, um, turn this into uh, something represented by rotational quantities like angular velocity, for instance. So um, knowing that the velocity of an object relates to the angular velocity by r omega, we can substitute that in and say that the kinetic energy of this object is one half m times r squared times omega squared, like that. And so if we compare this equation here to the um, usual equation, in rotation, it's a running theme that all of the equations are pretty much one-to-one -one in what each quantity is represented by. So for instance, uh, one half obviously correlates to just one half. That's a given. But also velocity generally is just replaced with angular velocity, as we see down here. So then if we think about mass being the only one left, well, that leaves this mr squared term as the only thing that could um, count as the rotational mass, if we're to call it that. From that alone, we can consider the inertia of this like point mass that's rotating to be mr squared. And so the moment of inertia of a rotating point mass is mr squared, and that's in units of kilogram meters squared. That's all well and good, but that's a fairly simple situation. And it's not something you're gonna see very often, uh, especially in the real world. So we're going to apply this to a more realistic object that's kind of continuously distributed, like this rod right here. So we've got a rod of length L and a mass M, and it's got a uniform thickness and density, which is going to make things a lot easier for us. And it's rotating about an axis through one end with an angular velocity omega. Our goal here is we want to kind of split the rod into our previous situation here, where we've just got singular point masses, and then maybe we just add up all of their kinetic energies at the end. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take this rod and kind of like you see here, we're going to split it into tiny slivers of mass dm. And each one's going to have a width dr. It's like a component of the, the total length of the rod itself. Each of these dms are a different um, distance r away from the pivot point, which means that dm is technically intertwined with this r coordinate here. So we need to keep that in mind when we start uh, trying to integrate things. But for now, all we need to do is figure out a formula for the kinetic energy of a singular mass dm. If we're doing that, well, we're already given the angular velocity omega, so we can kind of use this equation right here as a reference. So then the kinetic energy is going to be one half times dm now, as opposed to uh, the mass that we had before, um, and then times r squared omega squared. And that's really all we need to write there. 
Uh, there's not really much else we could do besides maybe rearrange some things. So now that we've got an idea of the kinetic energy of a singular sliver, dm, we now need to set up our summation function to like add all of these up, and that's essentially an integral. In thinking about what's going to go in our integral, well, we can pull the one half out because that's not really going to vary with the thing we're integrating through, which is the length of the rod. Everything is multiplied by one half. Something else that we can pull out of the integral is this omega term right here. Because if you think about it, every single point along this rod is rotating with the same angular velocity. Otherwise, you'd have some weird stuff going on where the farther end of the rod would be bending away from the uh, closer end of the rod. They'd be moving at different angular velocities, spinning at different rates. That's weird. Pulling out the one half and the omega squared, the two things that do vary in our integral are, well, obviously the position along the rod that we're at. So within our integral, and our bounds here are going to be just from the axis to the end of the rod, so from 0 to L, R squared is definitely in our integral. And we're going to assume that the infinitesimal here is going to play some sort of role in our integral, because otherwise it's not an integral if we don't have some sort of you know, infinitesimal term. As a result of that, we can say that, uh, again, if we're pulling out that one half and that omega squared, we now have a new formula for rotational inertia that's actually more general than the other one that we derived earlier, which is the integral uh, from zero to L of R squared times dm is the generally the uh, moment of inertia formula that you're going to see on the AP formula sheet. And that's probably the, the most general way to reach this formula in derivation form. That being said, it's not the most helpful formula from the get-go. We need to do more to actually set it up before we can evaluate it and get a usable number out of it. So from this equation right here, our main problem now is that dm and r are not in the same realm of existence. We need to get dm in terms of this r term here, since we are integrating through the length of the rod itself. The way we're going to do that is by utilizing the rod's density, which is a tactic that we used when we were finding the center of mass of continuous objects in a previous unit. We're going to call the rod density um, lambda here, and that's because that's generally the term that's used to uh, describe the linear mass density, which notice that this is a mass per unit length, as opposed to a mass per unit volume that you'd see with a three-dimensional object. So if the density of this rod is the mass of the rod divided by its total length, that is a constant quantity for um, any subsection of this rod. All parts of this rod, no matter how small, are going to have this amount of density attached to it. So with that in mind, if we take this formula and rearrange it and use the density to find how much mass is contained within one of those slivers, dm, well, it's going to be the density times whatever the length of that sliver dm is, which we described it as this little infinitesimal distance, dr, up here. So uh, it's going to be um, the density, lambda, times dr, which is the length of dm. And so substituting that in, uh, we can say that lambda is m divided by the total length l, and that's times dr. And from that, we can now uh, successfully plug in something for dm that's in terms of a length. So this integral is now doable if you were to plug it in. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So down here, uh, we're going to use this equation as our launching point, And we're going to finally figure out the rotational inertia of um, a continuous uniform rod. So uh, we're going to do uh, start as normal, um, just integral of r squared. But then for dm, we're going to go ahead and substitute in this m over l dr. Now, m nor l are uh, going to vary with the uh, position along the rod. Both of those are just constants of the rod itself. So we can pull those out of the integral, and what we're left with is r squared times dr. And that's a fairly simple integral to evaluate. So if we carry this through, we're going to do m over l, and then evaluating our integral, we've got um, r l cubed over 3 minus zero, because r squared integrated will be r cubed over three. And so, once we simplify that, we will find that the moment of inertia 
of a rod rotated about its end is one third ml squared. Taking a look at a couple of other moments of inertia. Well, we've already got two that we can write down. Um, we know that a point mass at some distance r away from its axis is m r squared. Nice and simple. And now we know that a rod of length l uh, rotated about one of its ends is one third m l squared. One that's uh, interesting to note here is this one over here, where we've got a hoop of radius r um, that's uh, rotated through its center. And an important remark to keep in mind here is that all of the mass is located at this distance r away from the pivot. Now, think of another object in this table where all of the mass is located a distance r away from the center. I'll give you a second. Pause if you need to. It turns out that that condition applies to this situation over here as well. All of the mass, m, is located a distance r away from the center. So logically then, it follows that this object is also going to have a moment of inertia of mr squared, although you can prove that with calculus as well. So a couple of other ones here. Um, a solid disk is going to have a moment of inertia of 1 half mr squared, and a sphere of radius r is going to have a moment of inertia of 2 fifths mr squared. A rod of length l that's rotated about its center will have a moment of inertia of 1 twelfth ml squared. Now, take a look at these rods down. So a rod rotated about its center, you could think of as if you hold up your pencil or your pen or whatever uh, object that's kind of like a rod that you'd have on your desk, and you hold it about its center like that. Well, if you try to rotate this thing back and forth, like I'm doing here, notice how much resistance you feel when you do this. Okay, really take it in. Now stop. What I want you to do now is move your pivot point to the end of your pencil, like this. Now, if you do the exact same thing, you just wiggle it back and forth, notice how much more resistance you feel when you do that. You should feel quite a bit. Well, if we'll take a look at the moment of inertia equations down here, we can get a feel for why. Remember that inertia is a resistance to an object's change in motion. If um, the moment of inertia of the rod rotated about its center is 1 12th ml squared, and the rod rotated about its end is 1 3rd ml squared, that means that when a rod is rotated about one of its ends, it is four times more difficult to rotate back and forth or to get rotating. And you can really feel that when you do this with one of your pencils or pens. So if you're ever having trouble remembering which one is easier to move around, um, just do that little pen trick, it's fun. The next thing you need to know in this unit is um, how to add multiple moments of inertia together if you've got something called a composite body, which means that you've basically just got multiple fundamental objects all combined together into some weird super object. And the big thing to keep in mind here is that if you have an object like that, the rotational inertia of such an object is the sum of the rotational inertia of the individual parts. So this object here can be split into a ring, kind of like this object up here, and a rod rotated about its center, like this 1 12th ml squared right here. So we've got usable numbers for these. And so uh, again, we just need to find the rotational inertias of those two individual objects, and then we can just add them together to get the total. So the rotational inertia of the ring is going to be mr squared, which the mass is five kilograms and the radius of it is uh, one meter. So the rotational inertia of the ring is going to be five kilogram meters squared. Now the rotational inertia of the rod on the other side is going to be one twelfth ml squared. So if we substitute in here, the mass of the rod is six kilograms and the length is four meters. So 6 divided by 12 is 1 half times 16, so that's going to be about 8 kilogram meters squared. All right, now that we have those two individual rotational inertias, all we need to do is add them up. This is kind of uh, similar to how we would just add mass um, outright uh, on an object. Mass is a scalar, rotational inertia is also scalar, so we don't really need to worry about um, directions or anything. 
So the total rotational inertia here then is just going to be 5 plus 8, which is about 13 kilogram meters squared. And that principle applies to pretty much every object that is composite like this. If you can find a way to break it into individual parts, um, you're pretty much golden for finding the rotational inertia of the weirder objects. And finally, the last major thing to note with rotational inertia is the parallel axis theorem. And this is another handy trick that you can use to actually uh, reduce the amount of formulas that you need to memorize, because AP does not really give you a whole lot of these. The idea behind the parallel axis theorem is um, the idea that we really revealed with our first formula over here, which is that generally the farther out you get from the axis um, that you're rotating around, the higher the rotational inertia gets. And down here, we reach another idea, which is that um, an object that's rotating about its center of mass generally has the most or the, the lowest uh, rotational inertia of its type. And any object that's not rotated about its center of mass is generally going to have a higher rotational inertia proportional to how far out away from the center of mass that axis is. So for instance, this disk that's uh, been displaced away from its center of mass to this new uh, rotational point right here is going to have a significantly higher rotational inertia than the disk rotated about its center. So the equation for the parallel axis theorem is that if you want to find this, let's say, uh, new rotational inertia ID, you're going to take the rotational inertia of whatever that object is um, rotated about its center of mass. So for a disk rotated about its center, that's one half mr squared, like this. Plus, we're going to add to that an additional factor of m times d squared. The m is just the mass of the disk. This capital D is how far away from the center of mass we've placed our axis of rotation. And so to get a feel for this and, and to show that it works, um, if we take the um, rotational inertia of a rod rotated about its center of mass, which is just through its center, that's 1 12th ml squared. We can show with the parallel axis theorem that the rotational inertia rotating about one of its ends is 1 3rd ml squared using the parallel axis theorem. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to say uh, ID equals 1 12th ml squared plus the mass of the rod is still little m. What is the distance d? Well, let's draw it out. And so if we've got a rod over here rotating about its end, well, if we think about where the center of mass is located, out here in the middle of the rod, that implies that the center of mass has been moved a distance of L over two, half of the rod's total length away from where the new axis is located. So our distance, D in this case, is L over two. So expanding that out, we've got 1 12th ML squared plus 1 4th ML squared. Now we can pull out an ml squared from both of those. And so it's going to be 1 12th plus 1 4th ml squared. And that is going to equal, let's see, 1 12th plus uh, 3 twelfths ml squared. And that's going to simplify to 1 third ml squared if you complete your um, algebra there. So that's kind of a neat trick. That means that you really just need to memorize the center of mass formulas and anything else Outside of that, you can technically use the parallel axis theorem for, which saves a lot of time, or at the very least saves a lot of brain space. That is all of the essential information that you need to know for rotational inertia in AP Physics C. That is by no means uh, the slew of examples that you could uh, find or play around with in this, but I think it gives you a pretty decent start uh, on each of the thought processes and tools that you need to be successful. So I hope this video helped. Um, in the description, I've placed the notes uh, page, uh, the blank copy, in case you want to um, take notes of your own and you're not in one of my classes. And I hope you have a great day. Peace.